Welcome to Kambali 2020, a Rebuild Bali Festival. This is a digital program designed to inspire, excite, reconnect and revitalize the Balinese and Indonesian communities from the 29th of October to the 8th of November 2020. Kambali is the Indonesian word for return or come back and it represents revitalization in the face of global challenges. The goal of the festival is to unite people in Bali and Indonesia with an international audience at a time when travel is not possible, but the connections among us are the most important. My name is Astrid Edwards and I am coming to you from, from Melbourne, Australia. I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations on whose land I live and work. I would like to recognise and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future, and I would like to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. As I said, my name is Astrid Edwards. I am a podcaster, a writer, and a teacher. And it is my great pleasure in life to talk to writers about what they do and how they do it. And today we are speaking to Avni Doshi. Avni, welcome. Hi, thank you so much. Now I believe you're joining us from Dubai. Yes, I'm in Dubai in my little that study. Is- <laughs> I am in uh, my kitchen in Melbourne. It is the way uh, it is the way of the world at the moment. Now, congratulations are in order. Your debut work, Burnt Sugar, was longlisted and then shortlisted for the Booker Prize this year, and we are still waiting uh, to see who is awarded the prize this year. So, many, many congratulations! Thank you. Thank you so much. How does it feel? Um. It's really, there are a lot of mixed emotions. It's, it's completely overwhelming. It's a bit surreal at times. I, it's been a difficult thing to digest, uh, particularly when you've been working on a single piece of writing for such a long time. Um, I've been working on this novel for the better part of, or I was working on it for the better part of seven years. Uh, I wrote it over the course of eight drafts. And so... Uh, to to be acknowledged feels amazing, but sometimes it's a little hard to believe, you know. <laughs> uh, it is. Um, it really is an extraordinary achievement, receiving and attracting that international recognition for your first published novel. It's. Um, I interview a lot of writers, and that is, you know, a, a one of a kind story, Adney. Before we go any further, and I ask you questions, and I have lots of questions for you. Can you introduce us to Burnt Sugar, the story, the theme, and the characters? Sure. Um, Burnt Sugar is the story of a woman living in a city in Western India. The city is called Pune. And uh, she is faced with the difficult task of figuring out how to look after her mother, who has recently been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Um, And the difficulty really emerges because her mother never really looked after her when she was a child. Um, This is a story, you know, some of the major themes running throughout the novel are memory, um, motherhood. Um, It's really a book about, you know, learning to look after uh, people who never perhaps cared very much for us, learning to love people who we don't like very much. And also, um, I think it's, you know, in some ways, a story about revenge. Um, so there, there are many uh, facets to the novel that I'm still even discovering myself uh, as I return to it. So it's interesting. Revenge is an interesting theme, and we will come back to that. But I just wanted to draw everybody's attention to your opening line. Now, you know, for people who read a lot, you know, famous lines in in literature is is quite a thing. And you have written a spectacular opening line. I'm going to read it for everyone. I would be lying if I said my mother's misery has never given me pleasure. Yeah. (laughs) How did you you capture all of that and get the reader in? First sentence, a mother's misery. You know, the first line actually came at the beginning uh, of writing this particular draft. Now, I had written many leading up to this, so a lot of the ideas were clear to me when I began this draft, but um, there was something in the narrator's voice. There was almost this 
other person inside of me that was speaking. And it, it came together, the first sentence came together pretty quickly, almost immediately at the beginning. Um, I knew it was the right sentence to start the story with when I could see the shape of the entire novel in the sentence itself. Um, and I could see so many of the themes right there. I could see the tone. I could, I could really hear the narrator's voice in that sentence. Um, and and the complexity and uh, ambivalence of her emotional state. And yeah, so that's really how I knew. Um, I didn't know the attention it would, I, I couldn't kind of um, anticipate the attention the first sentence would get, but I, um, you know, I, I guess that there is a kind of cult in literature around the first sentence as well, you know, people, um, remember first sentences in, in, in novels that they really love. So I, I'm really grateful that everyone likes the sentence. There is a cult in literature around first sentences. And, you know, a lot of great books don't have a great first sentence. It's not a prerequisite. But, you know, when I sat down to read Burnt Sugar, opened it up, I'm like, well, I'm really going to, uh, I'm going to be drawn in and captured by this work. Now, Burnt Sugar is many things. Uh, it is a novel uh, about mothers and daughters and families. It is a story of a mother, Tara, and her daughter, and Tara. But I also read it as a story of women and family and domestic spaces. Um, and of course, we have other women in the novel. There is Tara's mother and Tara's grandmother. And of course, and Tara becomes um, a mother herself at the end of the novel. So it's very much a story of women. Obviously, that was deliberate. But I would like to ask you a question that hopefully you don't get asked much. That kind of means the men were left out of it. Uh, and the men aren't that important uh, to much of the actual action. They certainly feature in the novel, but they are uh, not protagonists, not main characters. And I'd like to ask why you left the men out and why this is all about the facets of being a woman. You know, that's actually, a, um, I think part of my own personal experience of life has been that, and this is a very personal thing, um, women are central to my experience. Um, I, I've said in other interviews, you know, patriarchy and men kind of form, form the structure that I live in, I guess. Um, but I my my most um interesting daily activities my um closest friends my um family that's most dear to me they're all really they're they're women i mean there are men of course but i mean i have the most interesting conversations with women um and i'm really fascinated by the lives of women they're just the most interesting to me and I think my question would be, why isn't that the case in more novels? Because I, I, I find women absolutely fascinating. Um, I have actually been asked this question, but in a different tone. Um, people have criticized the novel uh, for not having, um, you know, kind of central male characters. And it, it was men who kind of criticized the novel for this reason. Um, and I think it's very telling, you know, um, th that this particular man that I'm thinking about uh, couldn't find his way into the novel because he couldn't um, relate to a male protagonist. And I, I wonder if that's a kind of limitation in empathy uh, or, or a limitation in imagination. I'm not sure. <laughs> it might be both. I would also suggest it's a limitation in much of the uh, international literature that we have that has focused on males, men's stories, and the action that happens outside of the home and outside of our domestic and intimate spaces. Um, I, I did ask you a leading question and maybe I fluffed it, Adney, but I was in no way criticizing you. I adore the novel oh, no, and no, I, I love the fact that there are um, uh, the men don't really do that much in there. They're quite inconsequential. And I found that a very relaxing 
reading experience. Can I ask you to give us a reading? Absolutely. This is a, a short section from the beginning of the novel. Sometimes I refer to Ma in the past tense, even though she is still alive. This would hurt her if she could remember it long enough. Dilip is her favorite person at the moment. He is the ideal son-in-law. When they meet, there are no expectations clouding the air around them. He doesn't remember her as she was. He accepts her as she is and is happy to reintroduce himself if she forgets his name. I wish I could be that way, but the mother I remember appears and vanishes in front of me, a battery operated doll whose mechanism is failing. The doll turns inanimate, the spell is broken. The child does not know what is real or what can be counted on. Maybe she never knew. The child cries. I wish India allowed for assisted suicide like the Netherlands, not just for the dignity of the patient, but for everyone involved. I should be sad instead of angry. Sometimes I cry when no one else is around. I am grieving, but it's too early to burn the body. Thank you for the reading. That is a very powerful passage. It, it does appear early in the novel and I did read it a few times. There was so much in there that I wanted to ask, but I thought we could start with exploring the idea of um, what mothers are and what daughters are and the the forever, how they are intertwined always, but also may not want to be. And, you know, Tara, um, who does have Alzheimer's, was possibly not a very good mother by traditional society's judgments. Uh, and Antara didn't enjoy having her as a mother. And now Antara finds herself looking after her mother who, you know, her health is compromised. And I just love seeing this ambivalence, this not filial adoration all of the time. Um, I have read an interview with you where you asked the question, why is this not more commonly explored? And so my two part question for you is, why is it, why do you think we don't see this more in literature and why did you decide to fill that gap? Um, I think it's hard for society in general and you know women as well as men to think about motherhood outside of these kind of ideal parameters. Um, I think it's not a conversation we often have. I know even leading up to my experience becoming a mother um, there was a lot of tiptoeing around certain truths, truths like, you know, the possibility of postpartum depression. Um, sometimes, you know, women have a difficulty uh, attaching to the child immediately. Um, you know, people try to construct an idea of motherhood that is very natural. And I would say, you know, Motherhood may be natural, but nature is is brutal, um, and <laughs> and I think there's a real brutality um, that that's linked with motherhood. I also think, like all major decisions in life, um, there's deep ambivalence connected to motherhood, and I would be. I mean, I think you'd be hard pressed to find any mother who doesn't, if she's being honest, have a great deal of ambivalence around the experience of be becoming a mother. Um, so I just, you know, for me, it's just been, why don't we talk about this more? I don't, I, I think it's really a, a fear. Um, I think it's kind of, you know, historical expectations that we're still hanging on to. Um, I think motherhood is kind of that last safe, split, safe space, that kind of container where we all just imagine, you know, we all imagine ourselves in this kind of cocoon of, of the mother. I think it's probably um, something to do with the maternal archetype as well. Um, but, you know, there's this monstrous mother archetypally too. And I think it's, it's important to honor that and to look at that full in the face. And I, I guess that's what I was thinking of and what I was interested in um, to kind of look at that archetype 
from different angles. So I'm interested in the responses that you've been getting. Obviously, literary acclaim, I mean, you know, shortlisted and longlisted for the booker, but you know, what about people in your life, but also readers out there? I, I think the people in my life, um, it's mostly been positive. I think the people I know are, are not necessarily going to share their negative reactions. My mother shared her negative reaction at the beginning. Um, she hadn't read the book yet, but she had heard what it was about. She had kind of read a synopsis of the novel and and she was really disturbed and upset. Uh, she told me I didn't have the right to write about these things. Uh, but once she read the novel, I think she felt comfortable that it wasn't about her. So uh, I think then she could kind of relax into it. And I believe she rather enjoyed it. You know, there are a lot of mixed reactions to the novel. I think people either love it or they hate it. It seems to trigger something uh, for a lot of readers. Um, some people, you know, point out how completely unrealistic it is and how, you know, the kind of relationship or the kind of characters I've described are impossible. Uh, other people say the opposite. Other people say, oh my God, this reminds me so much of my life, of my own experiences. And that's been really fascinating to me. Um, I'm also, you know, I'm a, I'm a debut author, so I've never had this experience where uh, the book has, where my work has kind of been put under a spotlight in this way. So it's also been a learning experience for me about how to, you know, kind of digest uh, having your work criticized, you know, at this kind of scale. So, so I am a reader. I I interview. I've interviewed about 100 writers this year in Australia and I can only come at their work and I can only come at your work, you know, from my perspective as a reader. And I found your characters incredibly realistic. Um, it felt like you were telling me a true fictional story, if that makes sense. So I'd like to tease out those responses that you have been getting from people who don't find the characters realistic. Is it because they're offended or is it because like, are they having an emotional reaction? Because I guess it's not mine. So I'm genuinely interested in, you know, the other side of um, the emotional response. I think that's such an interesting question. I um, I got one review yesterday on, on social media where uh, it was a very negative review. It was probably one of the most negative I've received. And uh, the writer, you know, she, she kept repeating what a cruel book it was and, um, she didn't like, you know, the, she didn't, she, she didn't like the sentences and she didn't like the, uh, the way it was told in the first person for much of the book. And I think that she, she commented on how it felt too in your face or um, maybe too immediate or something like that. And, and I wonder if maybe it touched something. I, I was almost not offended by it. I mean, there was, you know, there's part of you that kind of feels a little bruised. Uh, but at the same time, when the reaction is kind of almost like a visceral one, you can see somebody's having this kind of visceral reaction. Um, you're almost not offended by it because mm. I think, I, I guess, I mean, in a way that's the goal to be able to touch the reader, whether, you know, in whichever form that takes. Um, I just wonder if maybe it, it triggered something because there, there are of course people who just don't like a book, you know, maybe it just doesn't speak to them or, you know, the themes or maybe the style. Uh, and then there are people who have these kind of intent, there, there's a negative reaction with a sort of intensity and you wonder what is it about the novel that has a hook for them, you know, that's kind of grabbed them and, and held them in a way where they, where they don't know, uh, how to digest it. So it, it's interesting. I think, you know, I, I think it, I would love to actually speak to some of these people more and and, um, and figure out where, where it's coming from, I guess. Yeah. I hope you get that opportunity. And I don't know, I mean, I'm not quite sure, you know, what it's like for you to, to, to feel uh, the different responses from readers, but I think it is the mark of 
uh, great literature. And I think it is the mark of stories that last a long time that, you know, stay in print and are spoken about over generations when they prompt visceral reactions, whether they are positive reactions or negative reactions. That's what keeps people talking about a book. Like if everybody just has the same opinion, it, it's not going to be talked about in, you know, two or three years. Right. So I don't know. I would encourage you to think that it's a really good thing that you are prompting visceral reactions because it means that you have your words have created something, spurred something in someone's, you know, deep emotions. I, I think it's, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back to kind of the first novel I read that really produced that kind of a reaction in me. And I'm not comparing my novel to this novel, but Lolita was actually, when I was, when I, was I think, in, in middle school, I think I was, uh, I must have been no more than 13 when I read Lolita for the first time and I hated it. I had such a strong reaction to it. I think, and now looking back, I think it terrified me. I think it made me question a lot of things about myself um, because I was genuinely so seduced by the narrator. And at the same time, I had to ask myself, what does it say about me that he's kind of persuading me? Yeah. And I could also, I was this young girl at the time. So I had a kind of um, empathy for, you know, for Lolita herself. And it, it just put me in this strange position where I was, I, I felt kind of fragmented. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I guess I should take it as a kind of compliment because I've since returned to the book and it, uh, brings up so many things for me every time I read it. Um, so, yeah. That's... Yeah. I think that, I think it's possible that uh, readers of Burnt Sugar will be confronted uh, with, you know, all different interpretations of motherhood and and daughterhood, I guess, for, for want of a better word, and that people don't always fulfill or think that they fulfill or desire to fulfill the, you know, typical social norms um, that we're all supposed to, you know, adhere to. And that can be quite confronting. Uh, you know, you're basically, you're challenging, you're talking about just taboo subjects, I guess. Um, and I'd like to talk about the two main women in Burnt Sugar, Tara and her daughter, Antara. They both, at different stages of their lives, find themselves in situations where they aren't believed or they are powerless or people aren't supporting the decisions that they are making. Um, you know, for example, Tara in her first, in, in her marriage where she's not comfortable in that home and living near her mother-in-law and she eventually flees. I mean, she takes her daughter and she flees. Um, and she has no sympathy from the family and gets no support over time. And then I'm thinking about Antara decades later when she is trying to get help from her mother who, you know, is at the beginning stages of Alzheimer's and no one really believes her. You know, her husband, the medical professionals, even her grandmother at certain instances, you know, they're not really supportive of her efforts to understand and, and intervene. And I guess... What are your thoughts on, you know, the role and sometimes the powerlessness, powerlessness of these women, these mothers and daughters? I think um, it's difficult to win, <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. It's kind of, it seems like everything is sort of stacked against them um, from the medical model all the way to, um, you know, their status in society, um, to even the support that they receive from other women. I think that there is, um, you know, the other women in the novel seem to undermine them rather than really support them in any way. Um, you can see that even though Anthara is trying to really look after her mother. She's also simultaneously trying to undermine her mother and vice versa. And I think 
you know, that isn't something, and I, it was important to me that this wasn't something that kind of just existed between Antara and Tara. I wanted to really um, illuminate the fact that these things are generational. So you, you see it pretty much uh, at the beginning with, with uh, the grandmother. You know, she's talking about her own daughter. She's discussing her, the possibility that her own daughter has dementia. And she's talking about burying her own daughter. And her primary concern is, oh my God, she's gotten so fat. How will we get the rings off her finger? <laughs> so, I mean, this is a kind of um, intergenerational trauma uh, and a kind of uh, self-loathing that emanates outward and becomes uh, a loathing of, you know, the child who is, is sort of a mirror of the self. And I thought that that um, relationship between, you know, the, the mother as a woman and as a self, and then just the reflection that she sees in her own child, to me, that was really fascinating. Um, the way that that uh, kind of cycles through through these relationships. I have to apologize. I've been saying Antara and that uh, indicates my uh, Western pronunciation. I apologize, Antara. <laughs> right. yeah, <that's> fine. <laughs> um, I agree with what you just said. And I would also throw in my interpretation of the mothers-in-law. Um, you know, uh, there are kind of um, two examples of mother-in-laws and both of them aren't particularly women that you would want to spend a lot of time with. They don't make it easy for their families or for their daughter-in-laws, which, you know, um, uh, we, we can all kind of, you know, maybe point to our own experiences in life um, or those that we uh, know, but it's that different figure of the mother, isn't it? The, the mother-in-law who, you know, uh, creates and brings in a new family, I guess. I think the mother-in-laws are so interesting and I, you know, I have children of my own now and I have a new way of thinking about mother-in-laws because I am beginning to understand this kind of possessive, um, you know, desire to hold on to my children in a way. And if I have to kind of imagine my life forward and what it'll be like to sort of share them. I have to say, I don't know that I'm going to be a great mother-in-law, you know, so I actually have a good deal of empathy uh, for these women in, in kind of all the, all the positions and all the relationships they find themselves in. Um, I think it's also a question of trying to maintain power and trying to maintain a sense of identity. What do you do when your entire identity is hinged on another person? Um, and where does that really leave you? And if the mother-in-law sees her entire identity hinged upon you know, who her son is and how her son relates to her, how does she relinquish that without relinquishing who she is or who she understands herself to be? Um, and I think, you know, those things really require a lot of work. They require a lot of introspection, which is also something I'm really interested in. I'm interested in the work that we do on ourselves, um, even in a kind of new agey way, you know, everybody's talking about working on themselves. But I think, I think there's, you know, there's something kind of amazing about that. Um, and also the possibility, you know, really believing in the possibility that you can change yourself. And that's a really, also a kind of central question for me in the novel. Can you escape your upbringing? Can you escape your conditioning? Can you escape uh, the pressures and the weight that society puts on you? Um, and so I think all of the women in the novel are kind of, you know, by turn either bowing to these pressures or then trying to push, push back against them. And so there is that constant uh, motion, I think, for all of them. There is a very clear voice in the novel. It is established in that first line, but it, it stays throughout. And this is always a, a slightly leading and difficult question to ask any novelist, including 
uh, a debut novelist about their first work. But I want to ask the obvious question, how much of you do you think there is in this work? And I mean, there are some basic parallels uh, in terms of you've studied art history and the protagonist is an artist and a creator, but you know, beyond that. Yeah, I think the, the novel is definitely inspired by my own knowledge. So uh, what I have knowledge of, you know, my mother's family is from Pune. So um, I've spent time there and I've, I, I drew, uh, I drew on my experiences in that city to kind of create a setting in the novel. Um, my grandmother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease four years ago. And so, you know, the way I've said this before, but the way in which for me, it was, it was devastating um, to, to hear that my grandmother, you know, had this disease. And I went really far into the research of Alzheimer's to try and make sense of what it was, you know, and, and, I, there were just no answers. There was, there were just kind of these big black holes um, where nobody could tell me exactly what was happening to her. And I even looked at, you know, various modalities of healing and I had it in my mind that I wanted to save her. Like that was it. I was going to be the one, you know, I'm a writer with no background in science, but I was going to kind of be the one who was going to find the cure. Um, and I, I had all this information and I didn't really know what to do with it or how to make sense of it. And the same way in the novel, you know, the, the narrator, Antara, she makes sense of her mother's illness through her artwork um, and through making art out of what she learns. I, I guess in my own way was making art in the form of writing to make sense of what I was learning. So there is, there are definitely parallels in that kind of a way. Um, I guess maybe, you know, I think more than this, this narrator really being me, I think it's more that she is a, a kind of uh, mix of my fears, my neuroses, my dreams, my fantasies. I mean, the way she talks, I would love to say some of those things. I don't think I, you know, I don't think I am brave enough um, or maybe I'm not forthright enough to say some of those things. So, you know, she's an artist. I always wanted to be an artist. I was never very good at, um, at, at, at you know, especially in the visual arts, I was never any good, but I think my fascination drew me into the study of art history. Uh, so there are these kind of parallels, but I guess in some ways she's probably the person that I fear I might be. And she's probably in other ways, the person I would love to be rather than me myself. <laughs> That is a wonderful response to a very old and tired question. So thank you, Avni. And I have to say, even if you don't think that you are uh, brave enough to say some of the things that Anthara says in the novel, uh, you are brave enough to write them. And I think that counts as the, as the same thing. You mentioned your mother's reaction to burnt sugar uh, earlier in this interview, but I'm interested in how you approached um, all of those in your life. Did you... Did you get permission? Did you just give the, this to them in draft form and say, I'm publishing this? H how did you navigate what some people might have, you know, thought was about them? So I kind of just held on to that old adage that like, you know, if that your life is yours and you own your life and anything that kind of makes its way into your life, um, that is material that is available to you. Um, and I actually feel anything in the world is available material to me. I don't feel too much. I don't feel really any guilt about um, who said, I think Anne Lamott, is Anne, is Anne Lamott the one who says if, uh, if people wanted you to write about them more warmly, they should have behaved better? I, I don't know. believe that was her. <laughs> I've, I've butchered it a little, but um, yeah, so I think, you know, I think it's all 
fair game, according to me. Um, I've heard other writers who I really respect say that they, they feel a very strong responsibility. I think Sheila Hetty, actually, who I absolutely adore. Um, I, I just love her work and her writing. And I, I think that she says that she would never write about anyone in her life without um, getting their permission. And I think that's incredibly respectful and, you know, empathetic, but I don't <laughs> myself operate by that. Um, also because it's not so easy for me to necessarily parse out, you know, who, uh, what has come from where. Uh, I think it all kind of gets really mixed up in my memory and um, the, even the way, it, you know, a, another friend of mine, she, she kind of talks about the magical compost heap in our minds um, and how we all have that compost heap and it's made up of everything that we encounter and we just draw from that as inspiration. So it's hard for me to sometimes necessarily know exactly where something has come from. Um, so yeah, I didn't, you know, nobody really had read the book before it came out. I think my husband read it and um, my agent, and then it went to my editor and publisher. But I, I don't think, you know, not many people in my life uh, read, read it before it came out in its final form. That makes sense. Um, you mentioned Alzheimer's before. I, and your experience um, with your grandmother, I, I, um, really appreciated your exploration of Alzheimer's um, and the disconcerting nature that it can experience that can, others can have. Um, I don't know what the stats are around the world uh, or in Indonesia, but in Australia, one in two people will either have Alzheimer's or become the primary carer of somebody with Alzheimer's. And I felt almost a cathartic understanding um, of, you know, what, I may experience what may come, um, what people I love may experience. Um, and I did enjoy that. But beyond Alzheimer's and, you know, the forgetting that comes with that disease, burnt sugar explores memory and forgetting in multiple different ways. You know, um, there's everything. There's, you know, Antha Liesl notes for her mother around the place in an effort to, to jog um, her mother's memory and, and maybe even get some validation from her mother, um, all sorts of things. Uh, of course, her major piece of art that, you know, is done daily throughout the novel. And I guess, what was your impetus? What was your drive to tackle what is a very nuanced subject, memory and forgetting? It is such a nuanced subject. And I think memory is really, um, I think it's the thing that makes us human. I mean, or what we understand kind of ourselves to be. I think it's what makes us who we are. Uh, I think it's really the way in which we relate to one another. Um, and I, I came to memory as a subject um, when I was working in the art world and when I was curating shows. And I remember reading about, reading memory um, reading about memory in fiction for the first, or, or really understanding that I was reading about memory uh, when I came to Marquez. And I think I read Marquez for the first time in my late teens or early 20s. And I was so struck by it. It was just so powerful, especially in 100 Years of Solitude. Um, and I just saw it's just stayed with me, I think, since then, just the way memory um, informs everything that we do, the way it can be manipulated um, for the benefit of some and the detriment of others, um, the way in which, you know, the way we remember um, and even the kind of selective amnesia we have, it has to do even with, with survival, mm -hmm. there's a kind of biological foundation um, for the way we remember as well. So I think it, it's always been really fascinating to me. And, um, you know, even the kind of idea of gaslighting um, is so interesting to me how it's, you know, memory can even be used as a form of abuse. Um, 
So there were just all these different layers. And every time I thought about memory in a new circumstance, these other um, aspects just began to emerge. And so I just, it wasn't even so conscious, honestly, through the course of writing the book. I think it's just the way I understand uh, even the relationships between all the characters, it, it's all got its foundations in, in this theme of memory. I have a quote here that I would like to read you. It's from page 50. And this speaks to me about memory and forgetting, but also that dynamic between mother and daughters and, and the manipulation of memory and, and how that affects our relationships. So to quote, it seems to me now that this forgetting is convenient, that she doesn't want to remember the things she has said and done. It feels unfair that she can put away the past from her mind while I'm brimming with it all the time. That's of course, Anthara speaking about her mother who is forgetting uh, everything. Their relationship is so, I think Avni, I'm going to be thinking about their mother daughter relationship for a long time to come. And I have a question for you. Burnt Sugar refers to, I read the title Burnt Sugar as referring to a scene in the book, a choice that uh, you know, the daughter and Thara made, kind of, you know, informed by her research into Alzheimer's and how she feels about her mother. It is something of a spoiler, but I think that it's really important to uh, discuss. Would you put that into your own words? Would you explain to the audience? <laughs> um, explain about where the title comes from? Yeah. Um, sure. So, there's a section towards the end of the book where, um, you know, Anthra, through her research, realizes that um, sugar and that, uh, you know, that Alzheimer's disease is kind of understood as, as a type three diabetes, which is something I came across in my research. Uh, it's something particularly practitioners of functional medicine and integrative medicine um, really believe. And that, you know, perhaps your certain kinds of Alzheimer's in particular can be um, almost turned on and off by uh, your dietary choices. And um, so Anthra reaches a point, you know, for various reasons with her mother, where she's kind of ha had it, you know, she's at her limits and she can't take it anymore. And she realizes that by you know, adding a spoonful of sugar to her mother's food every day, she can kind of send her mother deeper into this abyss. And um, yeah, so that's really kind of where the title comes from. We, I actually have never spoken about it because I think people, um, we avoid talking about, you know, things at the end of the book, but um, you know, for me, in a lot of ways, this story is also, and again, this doesn't get spoken about much, but this is really a story about revenge as well. And I think that's something that also makes people very uncomfortable to think about revenge as being a kind of pivotal um, emotion or motivation in a relationship between a mother and daughter. And not only revenge, but I think in Anthara's case, this is a kind of premeditated, slow, painful, painful for everyone hmm. kind of revenge. And I think it also points to her own trauma her own um, proximity, her, her own constant proximity to pain, and perhaps even a kind of dissociative quality in the way she relates to her surroundings and to her world. Um, so yeah, it was, you know, it was surprising to me when it happened in the book. So when I got, cause I, I don't know if I, um, I don't think I said this before, but I kind of write sentence by sentence. I, I don't plot or plan because I tried to do that in the beginning. Uh, when I first started writing the novel seven years ago, I tried to really plot out the book. 
and it never worked. And it would always be a complete disaster because by the time I got to that part, you know, that climactic moment, it just felt so dead. It felt so wrong. Uh, it felt that actually the way the story had evolved, that shouldn't be a climactic moment, you know? So I, I, I decided after that experience that, you know, from now on when I write, I'm going to kind of let the, the narrative evolve and see what happens and allow myself to kind of be surprised. And I was really surprised when I got to that part in the book. And, you know, I'm, I, I, I was in this scene between mother and daughter where they're at this moment and they've hurt each other so much. And it was sort of this moment where I thought, okay, now where do we go from here? Where is there to go? And when I saw when it kind of happened or as I was writing that this was the direction Anthara was going in, I was surprised. I thought, okay, this is a new side of her um, in a way. This is a side of her. I mean, we know she's got, she's, we know she's complicated, but this is a new side of her that she has so far hidden from the reader, I think to some degree. Um, she's really showing us now what she's capable of. And I was surprised. I was, part of me was a little sad. And part of me was really happy also. I was kind of almost proud of her. I was almost cheering her on. You know, I, I felt in that moment, um, that she had really come into her aggression, something that I think all of us women are kind of told from a very young age, it's, it's important to suppress, it's important to repress. We kind of push it aside and let it lurk in the shadows and it comes out um, from, at various times, but it's something we really try to disown. And I was really, kind of happy that she had taken a, a sort of ownership of it. As a reader, I was shocked and surprised, got to that sentence and, and you know, I did read it a few times, but I also felt horrified and elated at the same time. Horrified because it's a horrible act, but elated because I read it as, as her taking agency and control over, you know, over her mother, but over the domestic space, over her home, you know, I, she chose and she often not had choices. And I was elated that she got one. I'm going to say something a little controversial also. Sure. I, this kind of comes from my real life, that part. Um, God, I hope, you know, I hope my mother is not watching this. So that part actually a little bit comes from my real life. So I did a, a lot of research into Alzheimer's and I told my mother and her sisters that, you know, my grandmother, she's got this disease. We have to cut her off, like no sugar, no more. You know, I had listened uh, to these different um, integrative doctors and uh, functional medicine doctors speak and they seemed so convincing. And I said, we have to try this. We have to try to take her off sugar. And my grandmother loves sugar. And so my mother and her sisters, they just, they said, it's impossible. They said, what do you mean take her off sugar? This is nonsense. How can we take her off sugar? What a cruel and terrible suggestion, you know? And I said, I, my reaction was, oh my God, but this could potentially save her life. And there, there was, on one hand, a kind of denial that it was even a possibility. And I'm not saying it's always a possibility. You know, there's plenty of people who would disagree with me, but I sort of thought like, you know, in a way by just kind of letting her eat whatever she wants, aren't we sort of allowing this to happen? And what's the difference between kind of allowing her to, sort of make her own decisions and then really um, consciously encouraging her to make detrimental decisions. And so that was the kind of interesting question, how important motivation is, how important premeditation is. 
and I really be, began to be able to see why that gap is important. Um, you know, more important the act itself, how the intentionality behind it becomes so important and so loaded. Um, so that was really, I guess, in a way where it came from, although I didn't realize it until it sort of happened in the book and emerged. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Look, it is an incredibly powerful experience for the reader. Uh, really, it is. And obviously, that is where the title comes from. But I know that The Burnt Sugar has been published under a different title in India. And I wanted to ask why, because the different title, I believe it's um, Girl in White Cotton, uh, that shifts the focus um, of what happens, you know, it shifts the focus to a different part of the story. And I wondered if you were allowed to pick the different title or what happened there? So Girl in White Cotton was the original title um, from the first draft. And the first draft actually looked very different than this draft. Um, sugar didn't exist, um, you know, at that, at that point for me, I, it wasn't a part of the book in any way. Uh, I think, you know, in the context of India, white cotton has a lot of, um, a lot of different meanings that I, I don't think it has, or it does, it's not as evident necessarily to a, a Western audience. So, in India, you know, white cotton refers to grief. White cotton refers to a kind of asceticism uh, existing outside of society, kind of always being this outsider. Um, white cotton really is mourning. It's the colors that kind of, it's the color that widows wear. Um, it's sort of the color that you would imagine for a person who's kind of about to leave you know, the plane that we live on, it's associated with death. Um, so I think that it kind of has a darker, I, I think in the Western context, you kind of imagine this, you have this image of this girl wearing white and there's a sense of purity perhaps. And I think in the Indian context, there's a kind of darker connotation associated with it. Um, and fabric and white cotton are a very central part of the book. Um, for me as well, white cotton and that kind of white blank expanse, um, I thought about it as memory as well. You know, I, I kind of related white, when I was writing, white cotton to me was a kind of image in some ways of memory, um, you know, in terms of even thinking about you know, the tabula rasa, um, thinking about, you know, what is what memory actually is, is memory a kind of palimpsest? Is it something that's, you know, layered and then erased and layered and erased? And um, are there just kind of, you know, the barest uh, remains of the past? Um, so these were all just images and kind of visual uh, sort of visual objects that kept um, coming to me as I was writing. So I, th I think that's where that title comes from. And I think we made the decision uh, for the UK and for other markets that we would change it to burnt sugar because, you know, those meanings would not be as readily available. Thank you for explaining that. And I do have to say burnt sugar is uh, an excellent title in the, well, in the Australian context where I am uh, sitting and reading. I have one final question for you, and I know it is a big one, and I know it is almost unanswerable, but you are shortlisted for the Booker Prize, so I am going to ask, where do you, where do you place burnt sugar in literature written in English? Oh, gosh. Um... <laughs> I think it's hard to know this <laughs> until I think we might know in a hundred years, you know, whether it's just one of those books that never gets reprinted and that's forgotten about, or is it going to be one of those books that's burnt and destroyed because it's so kind of blasphemous? Um, is it going to be a kind of cult classic or is it going to be, 
you know, taught in schools. I don't know. I think these are all really interesting things. It's fun to think about how literature, how, how any work of art has a life beyond, um, beyond our lifetime. But I think it's always surprised. I think it would all, I think of every, in every generation, I just imagine people would be surprised at what um, stands the test of time. I think also these things have been influenced by, you know, the values of the past. So even the even our education system and even what what is in the canon is kind of pretty whitewashed, pretty pretty male. Um, so I really don't know what that canon will look like moving forward. I mean, I like to believe that we're maybe in a moment where those things are changing. Are they really changing? It's hard to say. I hope they're changing. Um, I hope there's space for a book like Burn Sugar, which is really, I mean, what is it a book about? It's its kind of a, a small book in a lot of ways, right? It's a book about, I mean, I mean by the, uh, by, you know, definitions of what grand literature is, or what I was taught in school, that grand literature is. Um, it's a book about women. It's a book about, um, primarily, as you mentioned, it's a book about uh, domestic spaces. I mean, there's not really, they don't really leave their homes much except to go to the club or get in the car or, you know, so these are really the interior spaces of women. These are the interiorities of women. They're what happens in their minds, what happens between women. And so um, just the fact that a book like this is on a list like the Booker, I think, I think maybe where we are open to different kinds of stories, but or we're we're open to you know thinking about um, different themes as belonging to what literature with a capital L is. Um, yeah, but it's really hard to answer this question. <laughs> it, it, it was a big one, and I just thought I would yeah. ask anyway. I agree with you. The canon is whitewashed. It needs an update. There there needs to be less males in the canon and changing the canon is a, a it's a work of generational change. Uh, but I do hope uh, that listings like the Man Booker and all of the different prizes around the world are starting to make a difference. Um, I greatly enjoyed Burnt Sugar. This is what it looks like uh, buying a copy in Australia. And I have the date here. So you're currently shortlisted uh, for the Booker Prize, but we will find out on the 19th of November uh, the results of the prize this year. So everybody stay tuned. And Avni, thank you so very much for taking the time to talk with me today. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> Kambala 20 was made possible by the support of the Yayasan Mudra Swari Saraswati Patron Program and their donors. If you would like to contribute, that will guarantee the support for the program ongoing. You can follow the Urban Writers and Readers Festival on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and you can find out more information at urbanwritersfestival.com. Thank you so much for listening today.